Yeah, okay guys, now let's continue with our discussion. Sorry, the last lecture was cut off because of some issues with my recording. So we continue with a discussion on present value relations. And the last lecture we finish off with, um, we finish, oh uh, yeah, we, we finished until this part in the last video that I was discussing when we trying to value a dollar today in the future, we use this formula that is pretty similar to the compound interest you guys do in high school, if a high school math doc, and, and then we have to now, the second thing is basically the inverse around this, we try to determine how much that, how much a dollar today, uh, how much a dollar in the future is going to be worth today. And then we basically do the same thing with the same variables, but we now divide, um, divide one, one plus R bracket by one dollar, and then we're able to get this value. So if it's year T, if there's one dollar in year T, basically we, we take one dollar and then we divide, and our denominator is going to be, sorry, denominator is going to be bracket 1 plus r to the power of t which is um year so that is about that and this is our exchange rate or discount factors so these two slides are also pretty important okay now the time of value of money now we actually have an explicit expression for uh, v0 which is our um, present value what do we do is basically we take cf0 as i mentioned before then we just time your cash flow then divide by 1 plus r which is uh, improving uh, in, um, exchange rate, including our exchange rate right now. And then we just do this step over and over again. And now and then we're actually going to get how much value in the future is going to be worth today. So that's how it works. So it's kind of a similar to this, right? We're taking this one plus R to a specific power as of denominator. And think because why are we using this slide, not this slide, because we're not determining how much value today are going to be worth in the future when we evaluate a project. But when we know the cash flow in the future, we have to convert then with our R, which is our exchange rate, to the value today. That is present, net, net present value. So in this way, by dividing and act and letting 1 plus R acting as our denominator and putting our the square, which is the number of years, like uh, second year is square, third year is Q, four years fourth, we're able to find out the net present value. However, when now assuming it is a perfect market, but we still have to make a lot of assumptions. For instance, the R is going to change. And actually, it is almost impossible that the inflation or like um, currency weakening process will remain the same. So I would say the exchange rate is not going to be the same. Imagining yen and um, um and U uh, UK pounds in that example I mentioned in the last video, that even taking currency for instance, currency do have different exchange rates happening at different time, even in different minutes, different seconds. Therefore, we have a lot of different considerations to make. Okay, another example, I think it is pretty straightforward. If you have $1 today and interest rate is 5%, how much will we have in one year, two years, three years, assuming it is a perfect market? Yeah, so I don't, I don't think I have to go through this again. You guys all understand. And look at this interesting graph. When we receive a dollar and then when, look at this curve in the future, when we gradually increase the time, we can see that when $1 is a, uh, is received, the larger the interest rate, the larger the interest rate, the higher the value in the future. So you can see, you can take a look at this graph. You see, after 30 years, you can see if the interest rate, if the exchange rate is 0.12, that a dollar is going to be worth, you know, something like, I don't know, less than one cent. That's how it works. So it's pretty interesting. And if you look at this, 0.04, when you jog it back to 30, what you can see is actually the value is higher. So the larger the interest rate, the lesser a currency, a dollar is going to work in the future. So that's about present value. If interest rate is particularly low, like 0.04, then you can see a dollar in 30 years is still going to work 30 cents, but if it's, zero, if it's the blue line, in this case, with an um, interest rate of 0.12, you know, worth less than one cent. Okay, now moving on to an example. So your firm spends 800K annually for electricity at its Boston headquarters. Johnson Controls offers to install a new computer control lighting system that will reduce electric bills by $90,000 in each of the next three years. If the system costs $230K fully installed, is this a good investment? How do we do it? Now, the now it's given, given the condition, they, they've given our interest rate, assume the cost saving with certainty and the interest rate is 4%, actually certain, which is not really possible in, the real, in a real life. 
in the real market. But if you search what we do is pretty easy. Well, for instance, we reduce by 90,000, we just have to time it. Just apply the O formula, which I yeah, which I think you guys all know about, divide by 1.4, second year divide by 1.4 square, third year divide by 1.4 cube, and eventually you will get this. And now if I ask you this question, should I go ahead with this project? The answer is what? Absolutely yes. Because in the end, if we've taken account our initial investment, we've taken account the um, currency is going to be weakened in the future, we still get a positive number in the end for our net present value, which means the project is actually profitable. We're earning a profit about approximately 19,000 K, about 20,000 K, assuming that the market is real, uh, assuming the interest rate not going to be altered, it will stay by, um, by 4%. And then we should actually decide if you're a manager, though absolutely we should go ahead with this project. And now another example, which is China, you know, the China oil company, Sinoc, um, recently made an offer at $67 per share. You read it, so you receive this billion dollars in initial saving, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, we do the same thing again. In the end, our present value looks pretty interesting. We actually have a uh, present value of 2.6 billion bucks, which means we should go ahead which is the worst of the interest subsidy. You can read this example later, I'll put the link below. Okay, now we've actually finished with finished with the fundamental lecture on time value of money and you guys all understand how do we value money in the future and you hopefully understand what do I mean by the exchange rate. And now we're getting on to something interesting that even many bankers do not know about, which is perpetuity. So what is perpetuity? I'm not gonna argue with you whether we're gonna live in this world forever, but perpetuity is basically something interesting that talks about paying constant cash flow forever. So perpetuity is a little bit tricky. It seems like the meaning is if you invest in a particular thing, which perpetuity is usually a bond, which is issued by a government, the government is going to pay you after your investment a fixed amount of money every year. So they're going to pay you forever. Forever, you know. We don't know when the earth is going to end, but this party is paying me forever. How do we value that? Do you guys really think it's going to be paid forever? Do you guys really think you can get $10,000 this year, $10,000 next year, $10,000 when your grandson is born, $10,000 if your grandson had a grandson, had a grandson, and you still get $10,000 if your grandson, grandson's grandson, grandson's grandson, grandson had a grandson? Absolutely no. There's a large caveat that I think many of you say. If they tell you I'm going to pay you $100, it doesn't mean they're going to still pay you $100 in 2023, in 2030, in 2040, in 2050 because there is interest rate resulted from inflation and impatience. Therefore, when we, take, when we calculate perpetuity, we, all, we still have to do the same thing followed by what we've been talking about, time value of money, present value relations. Then remember to put the power, put a square, put a cube when you are calculating uh, and involving, involving denominator in your calculation. So in the end, I'm not going to go through this calculation, but if you multiply 1 plus r bracket in both sides, if you are a high school math jock, math team jock, I think you guys can figure it out. In the end, we get this clear and straightforward formula that says the present value of a perpetuity is actually c divided by r, cash flow divided by r interest rate. So that's it. But you know, as I just now mentioned, perpetuity is not going to pay you forever because there is something called the interest rate. So $100 today, if it's only $100, I, I would say in many years, you will get to zero. I mean, not many years, but in the end, it's still going to get to zero and it's not going to be a, a seriatical perpetuity. It's not going to be a perpetuity. It is going to end up to zero, right? That's how it works. And that is about perpetuity in a simple sense. And that is actually our simplistic, most simplistic assumption about perpetuity. But what not been thinking is the growing perpetuity actually pays I mean, pays forever, right? But, you know, sometimes perpetuity, we have to take into account the cash flow increase. Because taking account of problems like inflation, the cash flow might not be constant, as we have assumed right now, right here. So if cash flow increases, let's now make another assumption that the cash flow is going to increase by G. Then if you are a masking jug, in the end, you're going to get us like this. The perpetuity present value is going to be equal to cash flow divided by denominator R minus G, and there is a condition that R must be larger than G. And this is confu can be confusing for many students. Why does the interest rate have to be larger than the growth rate? And it is pretty straightforward if you think a little bit that if, if, the, if the growth rate is actually larger than the interest rate, 
the perpetuities is going to grow faster even with the interest rate. So it's kind of a, too fast. It's not the formula is not going to be established. It's not possible to be established. Then you'll get a positive number right here. Okay, so I think it can be still a little bit vague because I'm not really interacting with you in this lesson, but you know, sometimes students find it vague learning about perpetuity. It can be a little bit confusing in many circumstances. But you know, I would say for special cash flows, perpetuity, um, if taking account of my considering, what I think is I have some other considerations. I mean, perpetuity, all you have said is, you know, we're still making a lot of assumptions at this stage in our lecture because you know the real market doesn't really work like this at the Paribus, keeping many things equal. But yeah, that's a perpetuity. And if I want to elaborate a little bit more, there is actually perpetuity in this world. Not really common, but if you guys search up Council, C O N S O L, bond, which is issued by the British government, I think established by the British government, it actually pays off a perpetuity amount forever. Um, acting as a bond that citizens are able to invest in, which is considered as a fixed income or low risk asset. Okay, now I'm moving on to a way more confusing concept that is actually annuity. Annuity is simple income uh, definition, it is actually a perpetuity but not paying forever. So annuity basically pays cash flow C for T periods rather than paying cash flow C forever. So in the end, if we make the simplest assumption on, perpetuity, uh, on annuity, we'll get this equation, which is our old equation on perpetuity, minus perpetuity C, C divided by R times this particular equation right here that you are going to be pretty confused right now. That I know you guys are confused about. So getting to a little bit more about annuity, what is challenging about annuity in the financial world is how do we price annuity? Because we are able to price perpetuity because we know they pay forever. But when price annuity, we have to determine a time it starts to pay forever, when does it end? So then we have to use this formula that looks a little bit more complex than our old friend right here. And how do we do that? It can be a little bit confusing, but I'm still going to explain to you using the timeline method and hopefully you can understand but if you still don't understand please feel free to uh, uh, state a comment that i can actually open a zoom call for you one by one to actually do some drawing on zoom to explain to explain to you as well okay annuity so ignore this document so if you work in investment banking or if you are a finance department lecturer professor assistant professor associate professor researching uh, uh, re researching about annuity you will be contacting a table like this but now it looks pretty vague. And what do I mean by ADF is actually, um, ADF is discount factor. Annuity discount factor, I think. Yeah, annuity discount factor. We have to take into account of discount factor in annuity, as I mentioned before, time value of money, remember near present value. And now I'm going to tell you how to derive this formula from perpetuity. Annuity is a friend of perpetuity. It is actually part of perpetuity. And the formula is derived from perpetuity as well. So to, to understand the formula in eventually in the following lectures or in the future to understand how do you price an asset selling as an annuity, we start uh, we have three steps actually, which which six look simple but can be pretty confusing. That I hope you guys can understand. I hope I'm making myself pretty clear. The first step is just a perpetuity formula showing here that no matter what the time, it's playing C forever, paying cash for C forever, no matter it's year one, year two year t, year t plus 1, or year t plus 2, the asset is always playing cash flow c. And then you minus or less or subtract day t perpetuity, which is a perpetuity that only going to start after day t. So you see, after day t, what that means, you see, it says day t perpetuity, but in day t, it still says 0. I'm still not paying anything. But the pay starts when is t plus 1. So in T plus one, my thing is going to pay. That is day T perpetuity. I hope you guys don't feel confusing that in certain perpetuity, we have a day that starts paying. I know there are like the British Council that I um, was exemplifying about, and that is a perpetuity that has already started paying. But what if your business is going to establish and sell an annuity that you have to have this specific day, like 2023 March, that you're going to actually start selling? And many students get confused about why is it selling a T plus one. The reason is simple. I, I look at my, I, I hope I can clarify a little bit better. 
you see my notes, why is it starting at t plus t, at t plus 1? The reason is, the reason is, we are paying a t plus 1 because when we have a value, which is here is the value c divided by r, we have our value right now for a bound, we start paying next year, and the next year is the time that we can actually generate value. So I know I'm, I know it's a little bit vague, but look at why. Why is it paying off at t plus 1? Because when it's between t to t plus 1, now the, now the perpetuity is generating this value, which is here, c, c divided by r. Remember, we know this from our first line of perpetuity. So it starts off paying on t plus 1. And after we minus it, which, which this is the most complex part that I hope you guys can look through many, many times again. And sorry if I'm, now, I'm I'll, I'll try my best to make it clear, but these two steps do seem pretty straightforward. When you pay cash flow C forever, no matter what time is it, and now when you pay cash C also forever, but at a particular time, starting, but not now. Now, now it's day zero, year zero. We might pay, start paying, uh, we are starting to pay a year T plus one, and then finally, it's going to equal to this T period annuity, which can be a little bit confusing, which means T1, now, now year one becomes C, and in T plus one, it's going to be stop selling. So here's actually how we actually derive this formula, and how to understand how, how does annuity come from from perpetuity. So we first have cash flow that pays forever, then we have a cash flow that starts paying after t only starting at t plus one year t plus one, and in the end after we subtract both we are going to start paying in year one and we're going to end as at t plus one. Why is it so? Because in our third part, which is this part, we actually try we're actually calculating. Remember this formula. We're actually going to calculating day zero because we have to link back to our net present value. So we have the value right here and now we have to convert, now we know the cash flow, convert into day zero, so we get the cash flow for day zero. And that is how formula eventually becomes this. Sorry if I can't really uh, highlight this, but it eventually becomes this. C divided by R gives us our um, gives us our perpetuity, the rate of our perpetuity, and then it subtract C plus R, uh, C minus R. Okay, I, sorry, I get a confused point, but now let, let's put let, let's put this away, but just talk about what does this mean. By timing c plus r, c divided by r, which is a perpetuity, divided by this, we're actually finding the finding this. We're already finding this. We are now moving this part actually here. We're moving this part to time to year one and year two. As I mentioned, we are start going to start paying at year t plus one, then we're going to t plus two. Now we're moving then to year one and year two. And remember how do we do that? We use time value of money. Remember putting our interest rate. Um, putting the interest rate and one plus interest rate to the square as our denominator and then we times our perpetuity cash flow and that's it and not, then why do we have to be why have to, why do we have to subtract this number by c divided by r because this is a value that you're going to sell your annuity and by c plus c minus r or c, c divided by r subtracting this you are going to derive the value of the annuity so hopefully now it is a little bit more clearer and uh, I'm a little bit talkative, but I want to say this again, that if I want to emphasize forever, no matter what time is it. And the second diagram, second timeline is when we start paying at t plus 1, because, you know, we're going to price a perpetuity in the future, but it's not now, we're pricing a new perpetuity as investment bank, as a corporation, and now it's going to, the value is going to be generated when after t, after t, the value is going to be generated, which is c divided by r. C divided by R, which is the asset value of perpetuity, and after we got perpetuity, we try to push it back, moving this, moving back this to here. And how do we move it? Remember, we need the exchange rate, as I mentioned in the currency, and then it's going to end in P plus one. So that's what's happening, because we're going to try to finalize and trying to derive the value of annuity today. Okay, so that's about this formula. I I, I hope it's not really confusing. If you're really confused, please ask me any questions after this lecture, please contact me in LinkedIn or in the um, comment section. Okay, so that was a uh, formula and a simple example for you that is pretty interesting is that you want a lottery and it pays 100, 100K a year for 20 years. Are you really a millionaire? Suppose interest rate is 10%. So basically now you just uh, um, apply this formula that I show you uh, from, our, from our annuity discussion. Basically, here's the formula. 
So, um, oh, okay, another point that many people are confused, annuity discount factor. It's the same thing because 1 divided by r, in this case, basically means this. Basically means c divided by r. Why am I using 1? Because if I don't use this, if I don't use this formula by applying the ADF formula, what I'm going to find is I'm going to find the discount factor is in terms of how are these cash flows going to be discounted. But when we input C to replace 1, which can be $1,000, $10,000, when we input this cash flow into the formula of ADF, we're going to really know the cash flow for sure. And in that point of view, we're able to kind of uh, uh, make this equation and maybe sometimes we can do a trial and error to input different cash flow results to see what different cash flow and amount generate in terms of a value of annuity. And if we know a specific cash flow, if we are pretty sure about it or nearly certain about it, then we can use the previous formula, which is what I'm using in the slide I just showed you. So this is the final formula. And now moving on to the last example, basically I'm applying the same formula. So the $100,000 right here basically C, the cash flow, right? Sorry, wait, where am I going? Yeah, this, this thing right here. And now, uh, yeah, lottery example continuing on. And then we just basically have one minus. So this is uh, 100K. 100K is basically our cash flow. One divided by C point one is interest rate. So when we time it together, basically, uh, basically, um, 100, basically when we multiply 100K and multiply 100K to uh, one divided by 0 0.1, this is C divided by R. This part is C divided by R, which is perpetuity. And now we times it by one divided, one minus this, thing and um, one divided by this denominator, the interest rate, the interest rate basically, and then we square it, we square, uh, I'm sorry, we're pu um, putting an exponent, which is 20 years, and in the end, we are getting 851k, which means, are you a millionaire? Not really a millionaire. So you're answering this question right now. And what if a payment lasts for 50 years, same formula, and it will be actually give you more money, you will be getting nearly, you are nearly becoming a millionaire, but rather earning 991k. And how about if it's a forever and assuming that forever and assuming that the interest rate doesn't change and the cash flow each year doesn't change, we will become a millionaire uh, if it goes forever, if it goes forever. Okay, so now the most complicated part of this lecture is over that is discussing about the time value of money and actually understanding about perpetuity and annuity. And now moving on to lighter step is to discuss about the compounding. So discuss about compounding, this will be highly applicable to your real life, daily life, because we're going to be discussing about when you're figuring out your mortgage loan, we're figuring out your bank account, something like that, which is also important. So compounding can be pretty confusing. Why is it confusing? Because compounding can come in two different ways. Okay, so real life application of compounding, I think you guys all know about is bank account. When you input a loan, when you actually lend some money to the bank, you actually have this compounding effect of your interest rate. And also bonds, bonds are kind of a financial investment that usually have a low interest rate, usually issued by the government or corporations that pays usually semi-annually. And you also can talk about mortgages and leases when you buy a house. So um, when my parents first bought a house in Shenzhen, China, actually they had to put a installment about, I think, 20%. I, I don't know about US, but you know, 20 years ago in Boston, Massachusetts, I mean, more than 20 years ago, 35 years ago in Boston, Massachusetts, um, uh, actually, people have to pay about 20%, I mean only 5%, sorry. Uh, in Boston, Massachusetts in 1988, people only have to pay 5% of installments uh, for buying a starter home in Boston. But compounding is definitely interesting because you have to go to figure it out how much money can you compound, right? That is basically the common sense about it. And sometimes it can be highly confusing because what you're seeing right now, APR and EAR. And this is what I hope you guys. This is what I want you guys to understand by the end of this lecture is to understand the, and understand the disparity and be able to differentiate APR and EAR. So APR basically is annual percentage rate, and EAR is the equivalent annual rate. Why are they confusing? Or why are they causing so many troubles? Is that now actually the government is forcing the bank to tell the customers and the clients um, what is the EAR rather than what is the APR. Because when we talk about a only APR, we have this problem that, yeah, effective annual rate, which is this, effective annual rate or equivalent annual rate, is different from annual percentage rate. That's a problem, right? That's a problem. So if R, let R denotes APR, n periods of compounding, then your effective rate is something like this. You're going to be using this year formula, uh, effective annual rate or equivalent annual rate formula. Okay. 
Imagine this problem. So, car loan, for instance, if finance charge on the unpaid balance at the rate of 6.75% per year, if you borrow 10K, how much would you owe in a year? And if you calculate year by year, in the end of day 365, you're going to get this result, which is 10,698.24 for what you're owning. And this is much more than what you get from from your uh, for your from your APR, which is the annual percentage rate. This is the problem with that. So, I know. Okay, I want to elaborate a little bit more. Is that if we if we calculate with APR, which means six point seven five dollars, um, six, uh, sorry, which is six point seven five percent per year. So by looking at this sentence right here, which is easy sentence right here, we feel like it. We have um, we feel like we only owe six point seven five percent more. But however, in the end, we got this result, which is our year, which is our EAR. As I mentioned, there's APR, annual percentage rate, and EAR, which is effective annual rate or equivalent annual rate year. When we calculate in a year, we actually got 6.9%. Why is that? Why we're not days? There's also daily interest rate. Sometimes it's daily interest rate, sometimes it can be monthly interest rate, depending on what loan are you applying to. If you take into account of this, actually in the end, it gives us something like this. So that is why, remember, as I talked just now, banks are actually forced to tell the clients how much is this rather than this because this can be super misleading. So bank before, they maybe before, bank and other financial services corporations usually actually have tricked customers with telling them APR so they kind of feel like, oh, comfortable to actually apply this loan. But in the end, they actually require to pay this, which is EAR rather than APR. So, you know, this is just a five minutes discussion today on compounding, which I know it can be fairly complex. Uh, it can be fairly complex in the future because compounding also have a lot of risks, sometimes not, uh, not only this fixed risk like a bank loan, but now since we're um, exemplary uh, bank, bank loan, usually we have a fixed interest, so that's about it. So just want you guys to understand, so in your real life, you'll be able to kind of differentiate between EAR and APR and kind of make better distinctions between both to not really have costly mistakes after when you're trying to buy a home in Boston, when you buy a home in London. Okay, in the end of the lecture, I want to end today and then end this lecture with a short discussion on what is inflation. So inflation is basically a change in the purchasing power of $1 over time. And there are two types of inflation. One is a by Bannon inflation, B-E-N-I-G-N, -E and the second inflation is hyperinflation, or people call it accelerated inflation. So Bannon inflation is usually a 2% inflation, which is a 2% decrease of purchasing power for a dollar, and hyperinflation can be worse. It can go up to 10% or even more. So if any of you is from Latin America, I think you guys know about Mexico, Venezuela, especially Venezuela, I was, sorry, not Mexico, that's North America. I mean Venezuela, Brazil, and Argentina to the point from Venezuela to a point that even the dollar doesn't worth anything once a well in 2019 if you guys actually caught the news actually follow the news inflation is actually caused by um, it can be a result of economic growth because economically when there's an economic growth there's usually inflation because price is getting more expensive and if it hits a peak of the inflation it usually becomes hyperinflation which means many people are then not able to uh, purchase many goods at the price and the government have to lower, have to increase tax and interest rates just to lower the price. And at that point, of, at that point, the society is usually having a recession or a slump, which means people are spending much less and business activities are damaged and many businesses do go bankrupt. So um, inflation can be a phenomenon that is detrimental or it can be, in other words, in a more positive way, it is an indispensable part of the economic nature of our world. Because in our world, economy always comes in a waving cycle, like a sine graph, which you know from trigonometry class, that when there is a recession, when there is a slump, it always goes with a gradual increase of economy. And when the economy is at the peak, then you will have inflation, and it goes into recession and slump again. For some countries, like as I mentioned, Latin America, which I wanted, which I've been emphasizing, uh, Venezuela, inflation can be extremely problematic. How to quantify the effect? Well, we're using this seemingly complex thing right here, but you don't really have to actually uh, ha have to worry too much about it. Is when we have when we establish a wealth, and we have a price index, we just calculate the inc increase in cost of living, and you can read off read more about this later. And now we have this so-called so nominal inflation, and also concluding about inflation. 
for NPV calculations, remember since we said that a dollar today doesn't worth a dollar tomorrow, we've been treating inflation consistently and seriously. So there we take into account discount real cash flows using real interest rate. We also take into account of the discount of nominal cash flows using nominal interest rates. Nominal cash flows is usually expressed in actual dollar cash flow, and real cash flow is a constant purchasing power. So nominal things basically when we haven't applied time value of money formula, when we haven't applied NPV that we're talking about in this lecture, in the uh, uh, first part of this lecture, real cash flow is after we actually calculate the width of formula of NPV, putting that into our function. And we also got nominal rate, which is actual prevailing rate and interest rate adjusted for inflation. And usually as economists, these two do not make a lot of sense because they actually do not compare to the day. So we cannot really make some comparison whether our economy is growing or not. But rather, rather, we need to use real cash flow and real rate rather than nominal cash flow and nominal rate. So take note of this. And for the formula, you can uh, really understand yourself and definitely remember this for your uh, understanding. Okay, before we um, are absolutely finish our lecture today, I want to give you an, an example of inflation is that imagine you earn, this year you earn 10, 100K, you expect your earnings to go 2%, but Remaining for remaining 20 years, but however, interest rate are currently 5%, and interest inflation is 2%, which is the present value of the income. So the first part you are going to do is to calculate the real interest rate, which is 1.05 divided by 1.02, which now you're going to get the interest rate, because interest rate originally was high, but now there's inflation, becomes lower, you ended up with 2.94%, and then you basically just apply this old formula here with this, the, uh, you just add 2.94 to 1, so it becomes 1.0294, um, and you just basically do an exponent, and blah, 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 until you calculate to, um, to the 20th year, which you're going to do this not by yourself, by Excel, isn't it, in Microsoft Excel, and your present value is about 1,800,000K. Okay, so you, in the end, you are, what is the present value of income? After 20 years, your income is going to be something like this. So, just to make, just to question you guys that, if I increase inflation, what will happen to the interest rate? The answer is, if I increase this inflation from 2% to 3%, we'll get a lower interest rate, which is, let me see, if, it's, if we increase it 1.02 to 1.05, for instance, increase it to 1.05, for instance, we, I'm going to get 1, minus 1, yeah, if, I, if it's 1.05, if the inflation is equal to the interest rate, then in that case, we don't have any interest rate, and the future value is going to be worth the same as today, which is pretty interesting. Okay, so I hope you guys do understand about this. And yeah, just you guys can review about this, give you guys some time. So remember to divide. In this division, inflation is the denominator, and a denominator is the interest rate. The larger the inflation rate, the lesser the, in the lesser the real interest rate, the more the present value of your income. That's how it works. Yeah. But however, if the inflation is more than the interest rate, is it possible? This is also an interesting question many students want to consider. I was pretty concerned about this. If the inflation is more than 2%, it's not really going to happen. It can happen in a short amount of time when the economy is going badly, but it's not meant to happen in the long term. So it's not really possible for inflation to outdo the interest rate. Okay, so that's about that. So before we finish, um, just some, I mean, yeah. Extension, choosing the real discount rate. And key points for our takeaway is assets are sequence of cash flow. This is our first takeaway. And day T cash flows are different from day, yeah, minus T plus K cash flows. You're going to use exchange rate to convert one type of cash flow in a particular time into another and eventually calculate it back to our deriving back to our present value. And present value and future value are related by exchange rates. Exchange rates are determined by supply and demand. Opportunity cost of capital is expected return on equivalent investment in financial market. For MPV calculations, we have to visualize the cash flow. Remember to draw a timeline. After you got a positive number using the PV. PV0 or PV present value NPV formula, your answer is yes. We should accept positive NPV project unless we're comparing both project and one produce a larger positive NPV than the other and you have to choose one, then you have to go for the larger one, isn't it, instinctively. And special cash flows, real rate, nominal cash flow and real cash flow. Well, nominal cash flow, real cash flow are important data that we actually get from the 
from the from the maybe like a federal reserve system we get from the u.s department of treasury well then we convert them back to not back to our real cash flow and real uh, and real uh, interest rate a real inflation rate and then we're actually going to uh, finalize and actually understand uh, all the present value and extension qualifications okay okay guys so thank you so much for watching this lecture so in this lecture we covered a lot please uh, review your notes and please yeah try some questions as well i'll uh, post a slide so please review it again and if you have free time please we're going to read this really are uh, myers uh, Bailey myers and allen chapter two to three uh, enjoy it please enjoy your reading time and i'll see you guys in lecture three when we're going to come when we're going to continue with a little bit more of our present value relations and we're going to move on fixed income security that is a financial instrument that pays a fixed amount of money at a fixed rate which is pretty interesting it seems pretty easy low risk but it's, it is pretty hard to price it especially when we're thinking about combining that with inflation problems and we have to predict how much to ask for in the future so see you guys in the next lecture bye